Vaccines, there's a lot of debate over them, but one thing we should be able to agree on is that the science behind them is pretty complex. Moderna and Pfizer both employ mRNA technology that's never been used in humans before to fight a virus that's also never been seen before. Add to that the fact that almost any discussion on the topic immediately becomes politicized and even censored. Yet people are legitimately curious, concerned, and confused, since we're talking about injecting something new into our own bodies. Our first guest, Dr. Robert Malone, is one person who definitely has the expertise to speak about this. He invented the mRNA technology, but he was also recently censored by YouTube. He appeared on the Dark Horse podcast with Brett Weinstein, an evolutionary biologist himself, in a three-hour deep dive into the topic. We don't have that long here, but there are some important questions we can ask. Dr. Robert Malone is with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity. So I'd like to start by establishing your credentials. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, if there's anything else I should add, it's a big list, but you're actually the inventor of mRNA vaccine technology. You're a licensed physician in Maryland, a molecular biologist and an outbreak specialist, a regulatory professional, and you have extensive training in bioethics, correct? All true, <laughs> as well as uh, I finished a fellowship at Harvard a couple of years ago in global clinical research and clinical development. Excellent. And so clearly you're not an anti-vaxxer in any way, shape or form. Now, I don't know if the general public is still aware of this, if they remember, but mm -hmm. because getting vaccinated has become the, you know, accepted public policy, health policy, but this is still an experimental drug. And Absolutely. okay, great. So because there was an emergency, all the normal testing um, regimens for regulations for testing were sped up. So could you just start by explaining to us what was different? What, what steps were missed or, or sped through in this process? Okay. Uh, I don't know the full, I don't know the regulatory packages for uh, two of the products. Um, I have seen the regulatory package that was submitted in Japan for the Pfizer product. Um, uh, so uh, just to recap, we have two RNA vaccines and one adenovectored vaccine that's licensed in the United States. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, those uh, packages that are submitted to the FDA that have all the, uh, we call it sponsors or the developers, the pharmaceutical companies data that justifies uh, use in humans is communicated to the FDA and it's confidential. Uh, so the FDA does not have the right, even if we were to submit a Freedom of Information Act, to disclose all that information. Um, the Japanese government apparently does. Um, and so a group of Canadian physicians were able to FOIA, you know, ob obtain through Freedom of Information Act, uh, a Pfizer uh, submission made to the Japanese government uh, early, you know, prior to authorization of uh, emergency use author uh, use of the vaccine. So that's the only one that I know uh, the details on. However, I do know general uh, processes for clinical development of vaccines. And uh, uh, certainly there's, for example, just to illustrate one point, the general rule within the FDA uh, that helps drive the 10 year or longer timeline that's usually required to get a vaccine licensed, includes that there must be at least typically 3000 uh, volunteers that have accepted the vaccine and then they need to be followed for at least two years for long term adverse events. So at a minimum, we can say that the, any assertion that uh, there have been no shortcuts uh, is not valid um, for, at a minimum, the clinical monitoring uh, for long-term adverse events after vaccination. The, the Pfizer data package suggested if the Japanese data package is the same as what was submitted to the FDA initially, that they really did cut a number of corners having to do with good, uh, rigorously, I, I try not to get into the jargon of regulatory affairs, um, there are uh, typical 
analyses that are performed for all vaccines and all drug products prior to authorization to proceed into humans or uh, they must be completed early in the development process that include genotoxicity in a full reproductive toxicology package, um, uh, data on uh, biodistribution, where the, where the vaccine goes or the drug product goes in your body. And uh, typically, there is uh, quite a bit of focus on exactly how much of the active drug product is provided to the patient. And usually that's highly controlled. To the best of my knowledge, as I see it, uh, the active drug product with these vaccines is the expressed protein after, because these are all gene therapy based. So um, what's really active as an antigen is the amount of protein that's expressed in your cells after you receive the jab. And that's also not characterized and the duration of expression is not characterized. And uh, so we can't really say how much protein, in this case spike, uh, the key surface antigen of the virus, is expressed in your body after you receive the vaccine. Normally that would be something that the FDA would, would be very focused on. So I, I, I don't know what the full breadth of any deficiencies that might exist, and it could be that those deficiencies have been resolved uh, since the time of those data package submissions. But at a minimum, uh, it's quite clear that uh, we haven't, I mean, you can do the math, uh, we haven't had two years of safety data after 3,000 subjects have been uh, voluntarily administered the vaccine. It just hasn't been that much time. And so the normal processes that uh, have been time tested for vaccine development to ensure safety uh, at a minimum for long-term adverse events have not been met. Have I answered your question? It, you have, and it raises a whole pile more in my head. So it, it sounds like there's a lot we don't know about this vaccine. We don't know exactly what happens with the protein in our body. We don't know anything about reproductive consequences. We don't know long-term impacts. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. I, and just one small thing, it's not one vaccine, it's three different products right. and two right. different technologies. Right, okay, so one of the things I know that, uh, is it, I'm not sure this came out of the Japanese FOIA request, but you, you mentioned the spike protein and that was meant to be, I guess, benign, but it's bound, been found to be toxic, is that? Correct? Can you explain that to us in lay terms? <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, uh, I was fact-checked on this by PolitiFact and Reuters, and uh, they both asserted that I uh, misrepresented the situation. Um, uh, so thanks for the opportunity to respond and fact-check the fact-checkers. Be sure to watch the entire episode, now available exclusively at EpochsTV.com, a new completely censorship-free premium subscription platform brought to you by the Epoch Times. See you there.